So we're kicking off term two with uh, another wonderful corridor member, my neighbour, Aphrodita R. who will be presenting family planning as an artefact, India's small family norm and its afterlife. Aphrodita did not produce exciting larger research project on reproductive health and family planning in post-colonial India, um, a project which has been courted by many US experts. So take it away, Aphrodita. So before I start the session, I would like to pay my respects to the Indigenous monitor of the land on which we sit. I acknowledge that UNSW is situated on the unceded lands of the Bedigal and Gangtel people, and pay respect to the elders past, present, and emerging. I also extend these respects to any First Nations people present in the session today. Uh, there are some slight trigger warnings in place, but I, yeah, just let me know when to. Yeah. As a recent migrant to Sydney and someone who has accrued privilege from other settler contexts, I acknowledge how migrants can also be complicit and get entangled in the webs of power and hierarchy that are yet to be understood in their entirety. This project has been developed on Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee lands in what is now Kingston, Ontario, in Canada. And it's now traveled to Berigal and Gallica lands, and I'm still reaping the fruit of this journey. So, and um, start now. And this is a very crucial clip. It sort of sets the base of everything. So if you can't hear it, let me know. Conjugality has been a way of organizing life in India since the late colonial era. With each of the legislative changes towards greater sovereignty, we see more recognition of social norms. As Stephen Legg observes, while colonial governmentalities contributed to the construction of otherness, they also put in motion programs that undercut that othering. This was because the rationalities at play were colonial in that they needed to rule to save racial difference, but they were also modern in that they had to deploy means of calculation and functional equivalence. These two could work in tandem, as in the colonial census. Yet, these rationalities could also work in opposition. For instance, tensions could arise between a hereditary model of social status and a meritocratic model of modern society. Social modes of conducting modernity rested on the heterosexual unit of husband and wife. Love, sentiment, Familial attachment could be glued to contradictory practices. Kinship extensions on one hand and breaking away from the past 
and moving away from joined identities to individuated existence. This process has been treacherous and fraught with tension. Couples have been living their everyday lives with happily with also a set of worries and ambitions that are measures of how they have progressed. One has to be happy and also pay the bills. The enumerated and codified way forms of this family unit form evidence of such contradictory readings. Happiness is an economic outcome, which rests on several decisions that the couple have taken for a few years. Decisions about money, savings, food, clothes, and when to have sex and procreate. An entity that serves as a backdrop to this unit is the city. We are aware of the work that goes into governing conjugal couples. However, in order to trace their aspirations for a better life, we need to study the cities in their minds. Any notional sense of modernization is tied to city life. We are just about starting to think about the way urbanization guides a significant portion of a heterosexual small-sized family and all the aspects of life that are touched by their governments. The city is not simply a trope for this unit. It is a concept that holds this couple in place. It is how conjugality acquires a social geography. And in this case, the social geography is Bombay, Bombay's Wales, very different from dry Delhi, dry bureaucratic Delhi, to which I'll come later. In the last few months, we have found that India is now the country with the largest population in the world. It houses the most number of young people while also being home to a rapidly aging population, while fertility is seeing a steady decline. However, no such talk of demography is complete without the scaffold of moral sentiment that it rests on. What the graphs, trends, and predictions erase is the emotional architecture of the married couples that pivot them. If we are to really understand what Michelle Murphy terms as the economization of life, we have to understand how couples learn to love their family, their city, identity, nation, and ultimately their partners. Without this comprehension of the rationalization of love, we will not understand the impact conjugality has on India's decolonial journey. So this slide is very important. Uh, it sets the narrative for India's contraceptive uh, usage from 1965 to 1970. As we can see, these are the numbers of people who have accepted contraception, and this is from a Ford Foundation and Population Council funded study. I can give you the citation later. Um, we will see a graph called uh, a trend called sterilizations. And all through the decade, we see a steady use of this form of um, controlling population, because that's not necessarily contraception, it's long-term surgeries. Every time you see a spike, it's literally in the first half of the month. It's when the governments conduct, state, various state governments conduct mass sterilization campaigns. So you could say that right from the 1960s, we see a precursor to what becomes a symbol of the emergency, which are mass vasectomy camps. However, they are both sterilization, sterilizations for women and men. Even though IUCD, the uterine device, comes and goes, we also see that there is never a hesitance in thinking through uh, long-term surgeries as the most effective form of controlling population. So where does family planning in capitals fit in all this? It figures in two ways, as a mode to document and codify the sex lives and decisions of married couples, and to also index their futures. The statistics guide the visual world of advocacy. So this particular graph, is instrumental in thinking about the visual advocacy that goes as part of the program. The consistent trend of relying on female sterilization has been, according to me, a bedrock for India's historical fertility decline. Um, there is some debate here which we can get to, uh, but I stick to it. Even as the stress on other forms of contraception changes, this trend never disappears. Through this graph, we deduce the modes of achieving modernity and the outcome of aspiration. Any decision of whether to use a contraceptive, when to use it and where to use it, are decisions born out of emotions and aspirations for a better life. Here we must go back to a discussion in the interview with Marta Stewart. The year is 1973 when the interview is conducted. A mother doesn't believe in having two children in case one of them dies. 
According to the census of 1971, 218 of 1,000 children died at childbirth. She was also working within a set of lived experiences since her child, that must be in the 1950s, that had significantly high child mortality rate. However, by the end of this decade, the ideal type of, of a small family norm is two, and it becomes common sense. Here's an ad of a very typical um, advocacy poster where a mother is being encouraged to look, which is a form of IUD. Uh, she's being asked to go to a family welfare planning clinic, not a center, but a clinic. In the 50s, it was called a center. Um, please note the iconography. There's an elder girl and a presumably infant, one would think boy, but not really. Uh, not evidence in the photograph itself, so we don't know. But essentially, the attire, the sari, the, the, the sari on over the head is a form of signaling who should be part of or who should be headed to the clinic. Um, the process we see at work here is demographic transition. What I argue with this setup and the larger project is that demographic, demographic transition a demographic transition accent, it not only influenced many aesthetic decisions in the early decades of decolonization, but it is in fact alive in the way middle class conjugal couples continue to fashion themselves when they talk about population. Their opinions about the dangers of population explosion are conversations of the past and yet alive in the way it influences governance in tangible ways. Family planning in capitals is a museumized artifact and a way of remembering the 1970s, while also simultaneously being a crucial marker of modernity for newly married couples and their familial decisions. How can a theory be alive and yet a relic? I try to answer this question through an interrogation of popular culture and everyday life. What I mean by popular culture is a set of practices that are somewhat arbitrary, steeped in aesthetic choices, and are inconsequential in the scheme of one's political decisions and subjectivity. Popular culture does not define how you vote. It does not define how you uh, consume food, because that is this basic. But it does affect your cinema, your choices of technology to some extent, like the radio. Uh, the other day is a way of getting to access the deep histories of a place. Studying mundane acts open up arbitrary choices of segregation, violence, or love, and help us ask if these questions or these choices are truly arbitrary. I'm also interested in the specific form these practices take, the ones that are imbued in built environment. I present you with two visual material. One is a representation of the statist vision of the small family, and the other is the form that it takes in a popular film in 1977. This is one such ad in America. It's a multi story
So this is a call to the audience. So this is the popular film around the same two years after the short film uh, was released, and I'm, there is no direct ideological direction influence here. It is I'm I'm signaling the discursive influence that a built environment, a built apartment, or yet to be built apartment has on aspirations of a unit of a couple. And um, please notice how there is construction happening while they are talking. The song is about dreams of living there. Um, and there is a, yeah, but this particular um, shot is very important because of its en emphasis on the people who were constructing the building. Um, it is as if there are two kinds of populations here, the ones who are going to live in it and the ones who are building it. And um, both have dreams and both are part of the uh, cinematic universe. Um, as part of humor, no, short just went. Okay, in, it is in this interval, and this is like your interval, this is the second half of the film. <laughs> Intermeshing sets of factors that I introduced the inverted red triangle and its accompanying set of happy faces, which you will just see. Um, the Hindi slogan is Hum Do Hamare Do, and it direct, its direct transliteration is V2 R2. And it emerges at a particular juncture of India's demographic transition with a definite reliance on the notion of small family, having two children, not three, not four. Because I've already presented on the origins of this campaign in the way it used the Indian bureaucratic imagination and a Ford Foundation consultant uh, in an earlier session, I will not go further into those uh, details. What needs to be borne in mind is that the campaign comes as a response to the high and increasing birth rates as evidenced in the 1971 census. Um, and essentially from 1961 to 1971, the birth rates declined, but not significantly, and mortality declined because people were not dying of famine. So um, tension. Um, and so the campaign itself started in 1969. In terms of its volume in the, um, and, and official advocacy, its life was from 1969 to 1971. However, um, I trace why it still remains relevant in popular culture and hope to so show some of it here in this.
Okay, so um, how does the built environment help trace and code people's differing uh, responses to Amdo Amaredo? In asking this question about who is the audience, we also ask who is the audience to the post-colonial theater of performative developmental modernization? The, the walls here, the bus and train stations, which will be seen in the next slide, um, were not just hubs of cross-cultural and commercial everyday contact, but also spaces for very uh, conversations with strangers. You have encounters with different intellectual milieu. Uh, the poster slogans propagating the small family facilitated these discussions among strangers and invoked a traditional form of panchayat or village council uh, in an urban context. Um, the symbol and the slogan quickly became the, sim uh, the official family planning logo because of the ease of its replicability and because it, is, it was easy to plaster in literally any physical space. The campaign utilized built environment in a way no one had seen before this attempt. In fact, you can have another line of research on the way it has still um, influenced health campaigns in um, the way campaigns use walls, uh, public washrooms, and the way um, symbols are reproduced everywhere. The print culture was not something that started from the 1560s. It, the status of uh, print culture derived legitimacy from a late colonial uh, circulation of what it meant to be middle class. There was a self-fashioning around clothes, uh, children, and uh, the kind of status you have by showcasing what your house could or could not um, afford. And so uh, it interlocked, this kind of imagery interlocked love, aspirations to be modern, with a simple choice of delaying procreation. Uh, there is an extensive uh, lineage of uh, work on consumption culture, that, uh, and the recent one being Douglas Haynes' work, who has written on the late colonial visual, uh, visual culture and is perhaps the first manuscript on uh, advertising in late colonial India. In short, this campaign could not have been successful without invoking what people already were doing and consuming. And it also would not have been possible without invoking what Jonathan Raven calls the soft cities of our minds. The third act is this, which is um, this particular. So this is where there is a trigger warning. And we can talk a little bit about that Tamil poster too, if you want. Um, and this is one way in which a demographer tried to showcase the impact of the red triangle in this table. So you see that the influence is predominantly in the urban settings where people recognize the campaign. They understand that it is about a small family. It is also a way of locating your family planning signals. One person thought it was a dangerous signal. And this is interesting again, because it's not just one by the end of the decade. Many people um, think of it as a dangerous signal. And I'm coming to that. Uh, and more of the rural are um, not interested or don't know enough about the symbol. And we can keep this in mind when we are discussing uh, things later. OK, so this is what I mean by trigger warning. So this is essentially one way in which this campaign has been vulgarized and used to mock Muslim families. And so the person here is invoking uh, an image in which um, the vulgarized version of the slogan is Hamdo Hamare Bara, we two are 11, and then says bring population control bill, and then various other hashtags you don't need to know about. This particular poster is also offensive, Hamdo Hamare Sattar, which is us and our 70, Sabke hat me eat patha, which means we are all uh, they are all ready to hold stones and pelt us. Jite jo sam samhalti nahi ek, or marne ke baad bhi chahiye seventy two. Um, essentially hinting at the fact that large Muslim families come from multiple wives, and a man cannot handle that one wife, and but is dreaming of seventy two. Um, Fairies in his whatever the language is. Yeah. So this this is complete like racist Islamophobic BS. But um, notice how the campaign is still relevant. Notice how the campaign becomes the mode by which the racism um, 
and, and, and the overall segregation is coming alive. So this is another form of foregrounding the city and the way it works in the small family norm is that you see the ideational developmental family meet the concrete realities in terms of the segregation in the city. Delhi, for instance, is, and I focus on Delhi, there is again a larger project of what it would look like in other cities, was, for instance, a city with pre-existing hierarchies between the uh, areas with significant Muslim population, Dalit population, and the majority middle class Hindu and upper uh, middle class Hindu uh, government employees who lived in another part of the uh, state. In the archives of municipal bureaucracy, we also evidence uh, we also see evidence of how family planning turned towards population control. So I am uh, signaling as a, as a difference between the two, which other people have also done. We also find what Emily Merchant calls emotional eugenics built in the architecture of the program. Precursors of the anti-Muslim vasectomies of the emergency era, 1975 to 77, which if you're not aware of, we can talk about later, guide the incentivized sterilizations. Medical personnel target localities in Old Delhi with significant poor Muslim and many Dalit communities in um, the build up to the emergency and not just during the program. So no amount of consent from the community was enough. The language of targets and birth rates, exploding birth rates, were, uh, uh, were overwhelmed all kinds of appeal to modernization. Uh, we, can, we can use governmentality to understand the emergency era slum demolitions and urban renewal and how it spilled over to controlling the reproductive capacities of the people who lived in those spaces. Um, there is um, significant literature on this. Um, plus, um, and the latest being Nazima Parveen, um, whose work is in my office right now. Please, I, please read it. It is one of the many good works that are often not cited enough. Um, and, and it shows how mass sterilization campaigns are working within a framework of liberal authoritarianism. It isn't just straight up you know, authoritarianism, because that's boring. After this, we're going to stop over at this fellow, who is um, the grandson of uh, Indira Gandhi, and uh, under whom the emergency happened. And today he's quoting the slogan, as a way of mocking the current government and the, his uh, political and aims, political and economic aims, because there's Adani Ambani. So he's saying Hamdo is the prime minister and his home minister, best friend, and Hamarido are the two um, financial bigwigs who are holding the government together. It's almost like a political economy thing on the current regime. And obviously, it worked the current government and he currently has, it's a whole other story, we can talk about it later. <laughs> Essentially, though, he is recalling the 70s and the crony capitalism, which was part of his grandmother's regime. So that's cool. The other way in which built environment still figures with the city is the way even in 2020, 18, 2018, we see films invoke the campaign and the symbol as a way of understanding urbanization. And for instance, this still here is from a film where our hero is trying to pursue a film protagonist or something. And he is from a um, small town. And so this bus and the symbol signifies the smallness of the town. It is no longer part of the vocabulary and iconography of Delhi and developmental Delhi. It is, in fact, right now, a, a less than urban uh, Delhi, a, a, a city that is in Delhi or Bombay. So the symbol and the campaign often turn up in filmic environment of contemporary films. Today, the slogan has become a marker of a city or a town that is yet to fully urbanize. Like demographic transition, urbanization too seems to exist on a sliding scale that never seems to reach. Uh, just to let people know, uh, wherever you didn't hear sound, there wasn't supposed to be sound. Like the songs didn't have any volume in them. So don't worry, you didn't miss out on that. It's not a very formed question. Thank you for that really interesting paper. Um, one thing you said reminded me of a similar kind of comment by one of our politicians about 10 years ago, I think it was Julie Bishop, someone who said, um, is it Bronwyn Bishop maybe, who said, 
<laughs> he said, if we allow refugees in Muslims in, they'll have 10 children and take yeah. over our society. And it was that. And I just um, wondered, uh, I just wondered if you could speak a bit more to the way that family planning maybe was co-opted as part of an anti-immigration agenda at this time or an anti, you said anti-Muslim. Um, yeah, I just wondered if you could speak a little bit more about that or whether it was indeed um, because this is often um, invoked in anti-refugee discourse, yeah. um, this concern around large families and, and um, that discourse may be similar. Uh, just, yes, okay. um, definitely, the rhetoric around overpopulation, which is where the family planning and population control, the small gap that exists between the two concepts is useful. Because to say that um, Muslim families are not practicing birth control is the stereotype, is the form of um, weaponized demography that it exists right now. And you're right, it is universal in the way that it is. It can be applicable to anyone. The, the immigrants coming in from Bangladesh, and even though they're Bengali and they are from, uh, they're Muslim, so therefore they're Bangladesh. So um, that technique of looking at family size and somehow thinking of them, a person being backward or modern is being weaponized in this direction for um, the purpose of essentially xenophobia and racism. But it has deadly consequences because very quickly this this urge to sterilize becomes something else. And um, we know what we're all reckoning to, which is why even in political narratives, there is so much uh, reference to vasectomies and Muslim vasectomies in the emergency period. Um, because of the riots, which are at the back, background, working within uh, this imagination. Mm -hmm. And it is, and both parties seem to be aware of this, not seem to be, they are aware of the metaphor and the element of everything that is being talked about. Now, my problem is that we can't call women who get sterilized stupid. And that's what a lot of savior feminist commentaries, especially in the 1980s, were doing, which is to call out the government for making sterilization an, a, a, a natural form of governing, governing health and family welfare, even after the emergency. But there are women who are getting sterilized. How do we not talk down and think about consent in a nuanced way? Because mm. that was my other question about how did feminists from in the 80s respond? So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was really, you know, the, the, you presented that and and both uh, rightly point, you know, the the connection with um, immigration and immigration policies, etc. And I rather look at it in terms of. You know, looking at family control, birth co family planning, sorry, or birth control as a form of social control, and how it is, um, you know, from a colonial period and outside India as well, it is targeted actually to certain population and not to others. For example, you know, in most of the times in colonies, it is targeted to the colonized population, but not to the settler population, which needed to be developed. Mm -hmm. On the contrary. So, you know, that the good people who need to have kids, we want them, and that the bad people whose number need to be reduced because we don't want them. And and so um uh what I'm interested, what I wanted to ask you about is the reaction that it can uh provoke within that the people who are encouraged to reduce their numbers. And so they are sold the birth control in terms of accessing a form of modernity, you know, becoming middle class and uh, uh, with those families, you have a boy, you have a girl, and what do you do when you have two boys or just two girls most of the time and then families will continue having kids until they have finally a boy and sometimes I can have then seven kids and you woman with seven children 
seven girls and she did, she got uh, a boy. It was a nightmare. But anyway, that's <laughs> another question. <laughs> and so so then you know so in your in your um in your case uh have you looked at so that's the point you know those people those families those groups of people who uh, uh respond who uh resisted that imposition because they saw it as an intrusion into uh their their lives and 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 they did not see it as they did not they did not see it as a, as as a kind of way through which they could access modernity or whatever they saw it as an intrusion as an imposition mm -hmm. definitely especially after the uh, mass vasectomy camps or um the emergency yeah that's an extreme uh, there was example definitely like that is why Delhi is important because it became a symbol of the resistance um from um people living around uh down was it the biggest uh Basically, the biggest Muslim, historically one of the biggest historic, um, Muslim settlements, even that is a different word, uh, Muslim area in the in the city, and it became national news because uh, the area was going through slum redevelopment and urban renewal, and there was a massive resect a resectomy camp which was set up, and riots broke out. The word riot is certainly problematized here. However, there is. After the emergency was over, there was a sharp commission report which came out on the excesses of um, the excesses of the period. Nobody questioned the logic of family planning. What was questioned was the way in which the second camps were held, the lack of consent there, and the obvious violence. The resistance has also uh, come in the form of culturalist explanation. Muslim families don't need it or can't practice it, all of that. But uh, that that particular kind of argument has um, is so subsumed by the right wing right now in the majoritarian language that uh, few few Muslim families actually use it. In fact, there's a new book, S. Y. Qureshi's book on. I feel bad for it because the entire book is about how Muslim women are planning their family. Like we are not we are not behind. But there shouldn't be an explanation. The fact that the small family norm exists, nobody debates it. And in the aftermath of the emergency, in fact, that logic gets more and more uh, um, accepted because you're, uh, there's a clean break that the next government uh, made between uh, this notional small family norm and what the previous government did, which was a, which led to a more reliance on women. You know. Uh, work and work for themselves and their post mm -hmm. So from family plan to family welfare and women in maternal health, maternal and child health, which doesn't really mean anything except that women get sterilized after having babies. Mm -hmm. Not that it means they do a child then. I mean, it does, but for its specific no Yeah, so they accept the language to show that they're good citizens as well. Huh? Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Prachita. It's a really interesting paper. There's a lot in there. Yeah. Um, so I, I really want to ask you if you have one campaign or if you have multiple campaigns to aim at different socioeconomic groups. I'm thinking here about the highly experimental mime slash Kathakali mm -hmm. um, silent film, uh, which has been seen by urban middle class cinema goers and the English language as calling on women to make themselves happy, right? All of that seems directed at middle class uh, um, urban women who are um, making decisions for themselves, although there's a question mark over that as a joint family. But so is that one campaign that's kind of you can choose to have a, a small family? And is there another campaign aimed at a different kind of citizen? Who doesn't have full autonomy, who can't be trusted to exercise the right kind of choice, mm -hmm. uh, which is much more about compulsion and about um, irreversible family planning. And that then might explain why you've got some certain kinds of technologies aimed at certain groups of people, right? So Muslims and Dalits get sterilized, upper class Hindu women get IUDs. Yeah. Is that what's going on here? And have you, could you? Look at the data. Is there anything in the data to tell you that different groups of people are are accessing different kinds of um, yeah. contraception? Definitely. Um, even today, um, why is sterilization the most default form of 
um, controlling it value size. Um, if you look at data, the, there is an excellent book by uh, edited volume on fertility decline that happened in the South from 50s to 80s. Tamil Nadu, being very educated, being relatively better off than the Northern cow belt, as we call it, uh, was the first to reach uh, fertility, uh, which is like two child replacement level fertility, just because of women's sterilization. So, educated women across board, and I'm saying this very slowly because I'm thinking <laughs> that's good. Have accepted that after two children, I can just go and get a permanent surgery. And it remains the mode in with which southern states are reaching uh, replacement level fertility or even less than replacement in Kerala. It just feels extremely wrong, but also what is happening? Like if if that is seen as a safe form of contraception, that's just at one level, it's not right. At another level, uh, like I was saying earlier, it just feels like a woman is getting it done and she's sorting out her life. But that, again, is not even done. She genuinely feels that she's like two children, done, they're going to school. I can just go there. Um, interesting. So not different technologies, but different groups. In the long run, but the rhetoric is very different. And that rhetoric is depending on the political regime and even within the Congress regime, there was, uh, I mean, right now it's very blatant, the weaponizing, but within the Congress regime that came in the 80s, um, population control never really went away. The rhetoric or didn't go away. It just subsumed by Garimi Hatta, which is like poverty education. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, thanks so much uh, for, for the paper. I just have a question, uh, we've already been mentioned, but uh, was there any pressure, for example, on medical practitioners to kind of, uh, uh, to, to do, because obviously this is the authority, the, the man of the name of my club, who can make it before clear that, I mean, advertisement information is also important, but this kind of authority. Yeah, that is the second more of like, the population, from 1965. Uh, onwards, medical personnel, especially the lower rung, let's say your traditional midwife, your um, uh, the, the compounder, the one who is the lowest level of hospital management, is asked to bring people in and he's given uh, financial incentives mm. or a radio or a, or something fetishized to, in exchange for bringing in patients. And it still is. That hasn't gone away. And are they trying to persuade them or they're trying to invent medical reasons, for example, that you should uh, have be sterilized because that's kind of oh, that's no invention needed. These guys are literally just going in and saying, hey, you want a radio? Sure, come on. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's actually as simple as that. And it seems to be like, it's not how the whole industry works. Yeah, see that. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Afrajita. Um, it's always such a pleasure to hear your work. And every time I feel like more and more layers and points of interest emerge. So, it's time it gets it gets better and it's time knowing a bit more yeah, it does it make sense um but i wanted to ask you more about, um this interaction between urban policy and population control and you were mentioning if, if i heard correctly that during the emergency period, especially in New Delhi, mm -hmm. there's a kind of a dovetailing of urban renewal or slum reclamation programs, which are working hand in glove with population control. Mm -hmm. But is this, did this happen in a way to replace unwanted groups with more desirable groups? Is it a kind of state sponsored gentrification, one of the word? Like, you know, we'll replace the undesirable slum devils with desirable middle class families. Mm -hmm. Or is it about um, creating new types of dwellings that will perform a kind of environmental determinism on these mm -hmm. undesirable families, right? That if we get you into the right kind of housing, then you'll see the virtue of a smaller family. Yep. Um, so, firstly, uh, this is, and this is probably unique to Delhi of uh, 75. Suddenly, uh, so, you know, Dhamma Masjid, the biggest mosque and the oldest mosque in Delhi, um, with 
very deep political connotations in getting beautified. So the idea of beautifying that mosque was to remove all the unnecessary village-like um, living which historically uh, was there and be present with the mosque. And so in trying to, the irony is that you're trying to beautify a Muslim architecture mm -hmm. by removing all the urban poor around mm -hmm. it which also happen to be Muslim. And um, <laughs> this, essentially it's internal displacement of Muslims who were left behind after partition. So this is where mm -hmm. the a pre-existing register of uh, violence creep back in, and and which is where I had a fight with a prominent historian on Twitter. So it wasn't a fight. <laughs> his, his work was about um, how the Ford Foundation was foundational in in this in this moment in like pushing governments to act and and uh, get targeted number of birth birth rates down and in um, incentivized sterilizations. Um, however, what I think is, um, Ford Foundation didn't tell the local government to go and sterilize Muslims around Jama Masjid. The two, the way you said, the way uh, population control failed with urban renewal has nothing to do with Ford Foundation as such. Was Ford Foundation aware and didn't know what to do? Perhaps. But that is where it becomes liberal authoritarianism in the sense that the government in its documents, it's talking about urban renewal. It's mm -hmm. about saving the citizens from overcrowded living. Mm -hmm. In a way, it's the same, uh, the short films that you've sh shown. It is initially, I thought that the short films were like, for the middle class audience, the poor people won't get in. But it is essentially telling the poor people the only reason you are not able to get that kind of apartment is because you live in a slum. Mm -hmm. So we are removing you and giving you a better housing somewhere else. Now that somewhere else can be literally mm -hmm. at the edge of the city. Mm -hmm. And so that's when Nazima Prabhupada is also very important. It's, it's internal displacement. Mm -hmm. It's 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 reducing a citizen to a migrant in their own city. Mm -hmm. And it continues in, in various logics across the way that he still functions. Mm -hmm. Just that the mm -hmm. sterilization mm -hmm. part is probably missing when you want to go inside and then you see incentivized personnel still asking Muslim women to come in and get sterilized after the children. But does the government care what happens to these displaced people? Do they try and on provide paper. them? Or, no. <laughs> on paper. On yeah. paper, everything is perfect. Okay. <laughs> That's why there won't be a Shah Commission ever again because there won't be any good. Because everything on paper is that people are getting displaced is the wrong word. They're getting rehoused. Uh -huh. I think this is a term that they have learned from the Brazilian, the Brazilian Experiment with um, the you know the, the new capital that they were trying to build. Oh, Brazilia. Brazilia, yeah. It's a, it's a same kind of logic. On paper, everything is good. Uh, yeah, I'd like to just pick up um, the point that arose in Sonia's question about tenure because you know the, the desire to have a boarding is actually often a significant driver of family size. You know, if you just keep trying until you get a boy or possibly even two, so you've got a spare boy. <laughs> and the um the well, you know, it's seen as important, right? And I noticed that the couples at the very beginning were talking quite a lot, oh yeah, we I want to have two boys and two girls, right? Mm -hmm. You know, etc. And the love of the little animated red triangle cartoon, very happily they end up with a boy and a girl. Mm -hmm. But is there much discussion? I mean, and, and there is clearly in many, many communities a, a preference to have a, a male child. Is there any um, reference to that in any of the, of the propaganda about family size? You know, that it's okay to have two girls, for example, because that issue seems to have just been quietly left to one side mm -hmm. in all of the, in, in what you showed us. Um, the initial, uh, Imperative was to reduce the birth rate, forget about this problem for now, let's suck. 1971, when abortion becomes legal, the problem crops up in a massive way to the point that even Ford Foundation said, like, okay, I think we have to still talk about some preference because we know what was happening. Mm -hmm. And the birth rate, the sex ratio, immediately we could uh, see the decline in girl children. Um, it is then that we see some short films come up about the value of girl children. They can be as good as boys, which still remain there in health. Girls are as good. They can be dog, they can be engineer, they can be blah, blah. But she has to be productive. She has to be productive in her own way. She has to be uh, a productive member of the family so that she can replace them. 
and the um, newspaper ad advertising. And I, I, I would say that a lot of journalism around girl child achievers it, it continues to be about she's so good, she's so good in her studies. She can, she is the rickshawala's daughter, only daughter, who's now going to be a government employee. She cracked these exams. Wow. Every year there are these before that. And um, there is the vocabulary is that she's as good as a boy, or maybe better. Exactly. And she can go and get thank you for that reminds me. She can go and get social capital for the family mm -hmm. by getting married to someone who's already a government employee, mm -hmm. or who is who has as who has better aspirations or is placed better in the caste um, spectrum than the family she. Um, thank you, Regina. Once again, just uh, that was so rich. And as they said, um, I just keep getting more and more out of your work every time I engage with it. So I think it was awesome. My question is actually like maybe a little peripheral to your research and, and what you're presenting here, but um, you know, definitely not irrelevant. So the question is about informality and infant health because you've got was it. 19, was it the mother's group video like 1973? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, the reference to, you know, how you can't just have two in case one dies. Right. Yeah. I'm wondering how uh, much that would have been a reality in 1970s urban mm -hmm. India, or if that is historical or, you know, kind of inherited, um, understood, like an inherited understanding of. Of child support, infant survival rates, and kind of what, yeah. So what the what the infant mortality uh, situation was through the kind of campaigns that you're talking about, and what role, if any, the state had, um, and these clinics and campaigns had in um, implementing infant health alongside um, uh, family planning. Mm. Uh, look at her; she is one of the like rare English speaking people who have access to an American journalist. Yeah. Yeah. And she yeah. like how many would there be in, even in the census, she'd probably be the upper five percent of the country. And yet she will um think of herself as middle class and not upper class or um higher up there in the ranks because of the inherited memory of my right. family has had uh, later in the interview she says I had nine uh, sisters, siblings, and brothers, and all of that. In fact, all of them, as, as the American journalist mentioned, they were all part of large families, which meant that they, the large family in itself was not an index of being rich or poor. But she, by this time, is completely convinced that she is middle class. She needs to uh, remember that one child can just die. Mm -hmm. uh, not borne by fact at all, especially right. for her. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Having said that, uh, by 1970s, you do see a genuine move towards universal healthcare, perhaps the only move from, um, which was the commission, which did the, essentially they studied the, um, the system in Britain, they came back and um, as they, they wanted um, a public health uh, system like NHS, but um, at some point they was like, okay, let's have public and also private doctors can do whatever they want in their extra time. They won't be paid to um, work in the government facility, uh, away from the government facility. Um, today, there's a mishmash of both. Uh, without that form of universal health care, which in fact also has uh, imprints of the bare feet doctors in China, mm -hmm. um, there is a genuine attempt at um, reducing uh, mortality rates. And we do see the impact of these um, programs right from 1951, which is why the death rates are coming down. Yeah. But the birth rates are high. So it's almost like there's a wish of like, why is it coming down? It shouldn't come down until the birth rates are. So um, genuine impact of universal healthcare programs, but also a certain like uh, um, overhyped imagination for her saying that child and that. Yeah, that's what I think is that's actually really interesting to consider um those those memories and how they inform subjectivities yeah. and yeah. desires. Yeah. Um, can, I, can I just ask another little baby question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I so in the um, 
in the horrendous uh, Islamophobic slide you showed and the hashtags that you told us, you know, not to worry about, mm. one of them was hashtag Ariane Khan. <laughs> 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 So I was like, excuse me? <laughs> do you know what that is about? No. Do you? Forget about it. How do I get to the slide? I'm going to do it later. I'm going to do it later. I'm going to do it later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We'll talk. It's a different because the Muslim question, firstly, I'm not an expert, but um, social, again, local geographies matter. Uh, there are caste practices in Muslim communities, in different states of India. So a state like Kerala, the Muslim family will look very different from a state somewhere in the middle of the country. Um, and so the question is a little bit more difficult to answer if you're looking at a pan-Muslim Muslim identity. Um, the modernizing impulse and family size is accepted, is not getting debated at all. Um, what gets debated is um, the kind of stereotypes that are built in, the multiple lies. It's just so it overwhelms everything else. You talk to doctors, middle round doctors, lower round doctors, when a Muslim patient comes in, the entire narrative is already set. Mm -hmm. And and so how do you talk about modernizing or family size within that? Uh, Preset conversation. So the first, it might have been the first time I ever saw that sort of symbolism was actually on local TV in New York, and it was promoting Zionist development. Mm -hmm. And it was um, quite different. It wasn't multiple wives; it was many, many children. But anyway, um, did we have any questions online? Because um, Apodita's been grilled for forty minutes now. <laughs> <laughs> it might be time to set her free. Do we have any questions? No, Naomi? So the chat was just about that. I was just letting everyone know that there was no uh, audio in the Q&A space. Right. OK. <laughs> so well, um, thank you so much, Pujibu. Mm -hmm. That was fascinating, as you can see from all of the questions that you fielded. Um, yeah, and we look forward to reading more. Thank you. I just wanted to say our next seminar, everybody. Uh, we're going to clap actually a producer, you know, in a long sustained applause shortly. But before we do that, we all run away. 27th of June, associated with the NUD, who's on the other side of my office, which is just a chance of giving his paper, um, presenting his work for his project on post war internment of Nazis.